me and thank you for joining us. And uh, Jenny, we're all yours. Awesome. Thank you so much. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to be sharing with you some ways that uh, hopefully this might save you time and you can think about this over your breaks and start practicing so you can come back super efficient from the holiday. Um, as Doug said, I am the digital learning coordinator for 29 Chicago public schools, which means aside from driving all around the city of Chicago, which might not be the safest thing because I'm a horrible driver, um, also means that it's a lot of uh, making sure that I stay organized in supporting the 1,000 educators that I work with and the 17,000 kids. And so it's really important that I have a really uh, efficient and effective workflow so that I can keep myself very clear. And before this, when I uh, was teaching, I had, you know, 97 students across three classes, and then when I was self-contained, you know, around 32. And in all of those situations, again, having a clean workflow and being able to get things done quickly was very important. So hopefully we'll shave some time off your day and uh, get you back some of your minutes. Um, if I'm going to share a lot of different tricks here today, and I might go a little bit quickly to get it all done in the hour and save some time for questions. So if you want to connect with me outside of the webinar to get more information that I shared with you here or ask questions afterwards, uh, feel free to connect with me on Twitter. There's my Twitter handle, at Ms. McGarra, and I'd be happy to uh, talk more um, online off the, off the webinar. So the first thing that I want to talk to you about is email. And we're going to be talking a lot about Google tools here today. Um, but the thing that I want to share with you is how to get through all those emails that you probably have. Uh, there's something really cool that you could do with your Gmail account and actually your entire Google account, which is run Google Analytics on your own account. And with this, you're able to see uh, where you go, how many emails you send every month, how many emails you receive, who you send it to, who you spend the most time with based on calendar appointment. It's pretty interesting to audit yourself. And this isn't public knowledge. You don't need to publish who the person is that you meet with the most. But it's interesting uh, to look at yourself. So I always am excited to get my analytics report every month to see how it's going. But uh, this was an analytics report recently. So you can see that in a recent month, I, I sent over 2,500 emails and received almost 5,000 emails. And that's going up uh, to over 909 contacts. And in the past several months, this percentage has just risen every single month. And I'm a little bit concerned because if I'm sending 25% more emails every month, it's going to quickly get into the five digits pretty soon. So I need to make sure that I'm figuring out how to do this uh, in, a, in a smart way without overwhelming myself and, and all the people I'm emailing. So um, what you want to be able to do is get from those 4,760 emails and keep your inbox clear. And we're going to talk about this, and it's a concept called Inbox Zero, and give you some tips and tricks you can try right now to get there. But I have a poll for you right now. And so what I'd like for you to do is take a look at your little dashboard there. And um, I'd like for you to take a look at this poll and tell me how many unread uh, messages are in your inbox right now. So go ahead and take this poll. Let me know um, how many unread emails are in your inbox. And you can see it's slowly coming in. It looks like the majority of people have between uh, 0 and 100 unread emails, and some folks have between 101 to 500. And a few people have over 3,000 unread emails, which um, is, is pretty interesting, but we, I've definitely seen that before. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and close it out. So the majority of us don't have a ton of unread emails, so we're reading our emails, which is good. So the next step, though, is how many messages are in your inbox total? So now we're not talking about unread emails. I'm ta we're just talking about if you look at your inbox right now, how many total emails are in there, even if you've already read them? How many are sitting on, in that inbox? And now you can see that the responses are very, very different. It looks like we have a much more even spread, um, with the majority still being in the lower numbers, but we still have uh, over, let's see here. I'm going to let this kind of taper out before I give the overall math. So it looks like we have, oh, I'm going to let it, still moving. 
All right. We have over 40% of people have over 1,000 emails in their inbox. Um, if we were looking at over 500, it's you know, more than half of you. So most people keep a ton of emails in their inboxes, and that's, that's pretty interesting to think about that. So then the next step is to wonder, why is it that you're keeping all those messages in your inbox? So go ahead and vote and tell us, why, are, why do you have over 500 emails in that inbox? Why are they sitting there? Why don't you archive them? Why don't you delete them, uh, file them away? And this is a really common result as well. We only have 69, 70% uh, percent about responding so far. Oh, we're getting up to 80. But over 71% of you uh, use it to refer to later. Or uh, the next highest is a to-do list to do for later. So you're leaving that email in your inbox because you're saying, you know what, I have to do something with this. I need to reply to it. I need to do a task here. So I'm just going to leave this in here so I could do it later. Um, and, and less important um, is because you don't have time to read them. But most of the time, it's because you're like, I need, I need this. I'm going to have to refer to it. So with that being said, that's fine, but you still don't want to keep all of those emails in your inbox. What's nicer is being able to empty your inbox and have no new mail. Um, and that's called inbox zero. That's when you have no emails, read or unread, in your inbox, and it's nice and clean. And it can be stressful to look at your inbox and see that you have 3,000 emails sitting there waiting for you uh, to respond to and think, God, I, I'm never, ever going to get to any of these. But a good friend of mine, Corey Pavisic, said to me once that using your inbox as, as a to-do list is allowing your schedule to be dictated by the tyranny of others. And that really spoke to me. When Corey said this um, at an event that I was uh, as a participant, and I realized that's exactly what it was. I would wake up and I'd think, oh, God, I have so much to do. I'd check my email, and then I'd get sucked into this vortex of, responding to emails for over an hour and I wouldn't get to the other tasks that I'd meant to do in the morning. So we need to get out of that, uh, that yoke of living by the inbox. And so here's some ways to start cleaning up your Gmail and to be more effective with the way that you use email. So the first thing, and these are all specifically Gmail, so if you're in Hotmail or Yahoo, maybe this might convince you to start using a, a Gmail account, and it's not too hard to forward the email address so you don't have to tell everyone that you've switched from, you know, Jason's mom at yahoo.com to Jason's mom at gmail.com. But uh, there are some pretty cool tricks that you can use there. So the first thing is forwarding and aliases. Now, a lot of us have multiple accounts, just like the example I said before, where you'll have uh, multiple you know, Yahoo accounts or Gmail accounts, and it's kind of hard to keep track of all of those. But if you go into the settings area of Gmail, you're able to add in other accounts that you can send mail as. So you can see in this example that um, for my particular email address, Jenny Meesung at Gmail, I'm able to send emails as Shypad Teachers, as my AUSL, my work account, as my Chicago Public Schools account, as um, an event organization email that I have called Playdate Chicago, and I'm able to receive messages under all those accounts as well. So even though I have, actually to be honest, I think I have around 11 email accounts that I use for different reasons, they all funnel to the same account. So no matter what you email, I'm checking one email address. And I can send email as all of those different people as well, which is really, really helpful. I don't have to worry about uh, hockey or volleying back and forth between these different accounts. Um, and the way that you get to this is, um, hopefully you can still see my screen. If I go to my Gmail account and I go to the settings in the upper right hand corner, I can go to settings and in the settings I'm able to uh, change how my account works. So if I go to, let's see here, accounts, then I can see who I can send mail as, and I can add other email addresses that I own. And when I click on that, I can go ahead and put another email address here, like jenny at yahoo.com. And then when I click Next Step, I can send the email through Gmail, and then it's going to send a confirmation to jenny at yahoo.com. And if I click Send Verification, 
All I need to do is go to that email address through the yahoo.com and then uh, verify it by clicking on a link. So it's not that hard to do. Then if I want to receive emails from that, I can click on forwarding and pop IMAP and I can add, um, add emails that I can check through here as well. From those accounts, I'm able to uh, add a forwarding address and actually forward my email somewhere else. So if I have multiple Gmail accounts, this is how I can forward email from those Gmail accounts to this specific one. So um, through the account section, I can add who I can email people as. And from the forwarding and pop IMAP section, I can forward my email somewhere else. And that's really helpful because now you can see when I compose a message, when I click the from section here, I have a myriad of different email addresses that I can send it from. So if I want to send an email from my Chicago Public Schools account, I can simply switch there. Then I can switch to my AUSL accounts, my personal accounts, and my conference account. And you can see that with these different email addresses, I can change the signature line that comes with each one. So here's my signature line for my personal account and my work account. So all of these different settings change. And when people receive email from this account, it, all they see is the jmcgarrett auslchicago.org. And when they reply back to it, it'll come back to this email address. And since I have this email address set up to forward to my personal address, I can see the, those responses in the same place. So it's really helpful for me because, again, I'm not going back and forth between this, these different email addresses. I'm using one email address to navigate through my entire uh, email world. Let's see here. So the next thing that you want to make sure that you're doing is uh, checking out keyboard shortcuts. So what keyboard shortcuts are, are it's when you could just click C instead of compose or E instead of archive. Um, and what that allows you to do is save some time. Now you might think, why don't you just move your mouse and click, and, and you can do that. There's nothing wrong with it, but you'll see in a moment that being able to use keyboard shortcuts can make you a lot faster. Sometimes when folks are sitting next to me and we're working together, they're like, wow, how do you move so quickly through your screen? And it's because I'm using keyboard shortcuts. And that half a second might not seem like a lot of time uh, when you're working, but over time those half seconds add up, and in the end of the day you're saving minutes, and by the end of the week you're saving hours. Um, and to do that, you first have to turn on your keyboard shortcut. So in that same settings area of Gmail, where we turned on the, um, the, accounts, the, uh, the accounts to be able to send emails to different people, under general, about halfway down, you'll see that there's a section to turn on your keyboard shortcuts. And you definitely want to do that. Then you're going to want to go to tinyurl.com slash Gmail hotkeys because that will give you a list of all the different uh, keyboard shortcuts. So it'll show you all of these different things. So N for next message, P for previous message, C for compose, O for open, um, all that good stuff. And to give you a quick example of why keyboard shortcuts are so powerful, I'm going to take a play, uh, page out of a game that I, I would say I used to play, but I actually still play it, which is StarCraft. And for those of you who are online gamers, you'll see it. But in this game, it's an online video game, but a lot of people can play just using their mouse. So you can just click around on, on the screen to play the game, but you'll probably lose if you do that because the game's all about speed and building up your, your home base pretty quickly so you can attack the other bases. Um, and you'll see that the better that you are in this game, uh, the more keyboard shortcuts you use because instead of using one hand to navigate through the screen, you're using two hands and two hands are better than one. So let's watch uh, Nada and Moon here play StarCraft and see how fast they can be with these keyboard shortcuts. Let's see if I can get this to play. Oh, maybe. Oh, I might have to, let's see if I can have keyboard. I need a keyboard shortcut for playing this video. All right. Well, it would have been a funny video, but it seems like I can't get it to play right here for some reason. Um, and it was working earlier. But the point being is he goes very, very fast. The keyboard shortcuts help him a lot. Um, and it'll be in the online version of this PowerPoint. So if you want a little laugh and get an idea of how quickly you can move with keyboard shortcuts, you can check it out there. Um, but for those of you who think, you know what, that's just something else for me to learn. I feel like that's going to slow me down. Um, I, I already don't have time to read my emails. Why would I want to learn how to use keyboard shortcuts? 
For those of you who are using the Google Chrome web browser, you can actually use a shortcut extension to teach it to you um, kind of intuitively. And this free key, uh, extension that installs into your Chrome browser is called Key Rockets. Key Rockets. So if you go to the Chrome Web Store, you can search for Key Rocket. And what it does is it installs into the behind your Gmail. And as you're using Gmail, every time you click a button that could have been uh, that you could have used a keyboard shortcut, it pops up a little discreet message that says "Press C to compose a message." So it teaches you intuitively as you move through, or subliminally as you move through Gmail, clicking as you normally would when you could have used a keyboard shortcut. And eventually, you can start replacing those. Uh, mouse clicks with keyboard shortcuts and all of a sudden you're interacting with your Gmail with two hands and moving twice as fast through the system. Something else that you want to be using in Gmail are your filters. And uh, filters are really important because they can help you with uh, sorting your emails before you even get them. And so a way to sort them is through labels. So normally in Gmail, when you're moving through your um, inbox, you have, multiple, uh, you have multiple emails that come in. And in a normal setting or in a non-Gmail setting, you have folders. And with the folder, the problem is, is you can only put one email in one folder. So here's my demo account. And you can see here I have a lot of different, <laughs> I have a lot of scripts emails in here because I use this to demo Google Scripts. Um, but as I go through here, I might want to sort these and put all of my scripts emails in the same place. Now, normally, again, if I was using Hotmail or other types of email, um, email clients, I would have only one choice. I could put it into either a scripts folder or a training folder. But with labels, they're like post-it notes. And just like you can put multiple post-it notes on one piece of paper, you can put multiple labels on one email, which allows me to sort it in many different ways. So I can click all of these different emails, and I can click on my little label guy right here, and I can label them as scripts emails. And I'm going to click Create New, and it's going to label that script. So I'm going to go ahead and click a whole bunch of these. Oops. And I'm going to label them all as scripts. Now let's say I also want to label some of them as training emails because I, I had used these uh, when I was trained, or I had gotten these emails during a training. So I'm going to click a bunch of these, and I'm going to click on the labels, and I'm going to label it training. Click Create New. And now they're both labeled as scripts and training. And you can see the little labels right here in gray. If I look to my left here, I can see that I have both the scripts and the training labels here. And I can click on one, and it shows me all of the emails that are labeled as such. So same email, but I can find it in multiple different ways. So that's labels, and it's really nice to be able to have different labels. But I, it, it's also pretty time consuming to go through and click, 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 click labeling, scripts, training. That's, that's more time that I don't have. So instead, I want to automate that process. I want it to automatically label itself. So what I could do is create something called a filter. And what a filter does is it's sort of like a bouncer that sits at the doorway of my, of my inbox. And as emails come in, it sorts them and labels them or does other things with them based on the filter that I create. So if I go up to this search box right here, there's a discrete little gray drop down uh, arrow that, that a lot of people don't notice right away. So if I click that drop down, I can create a filter using a search. So I'm going to say that all um, emails from apps scripts notification. Let me actually see what this email address is. So all scripts from app scripts notification at google.com. And I'm going to search for all of those. And here they all are. Here's all the emails I've ever gotten from that email address. Um, and then I'm going to create a filter with that search. So anytime I receive an email from that email address, I'm going to have it skip the inbox. I don't even want to read those because it's just informational. And I also want to apply the label scripts. Um, and I'm going to mark it as red so it doesn't count against my unread emails. And I'm going to not only have that due to all future emails from app scripts notifications at google.com, but I'm also going to apply that filter to all the past emails that I've gotten from app scripts notification. So it's going to label all of these guys down here for me too. So I'm going to click create filter and you're going to see 
all of these now have all are out of my inbox. So if I click on scripts, you can see these all are now in the script section here. And um, I only have one unread email now in the script section. All the rest of them are read because I had it automatically forced to mark as read. So that's a quick way to clear out my inbox. It not only marked them as read, put them in a label, um, but it also archived them. And something important to note about Gmail is archiving is the same thing as like shoving something in a file cabinet drawer. It's not throwing something away or putting it in the trash. It's just putting it in the drawer so that it's not sitting on the top of your desk anymore. So it takes it out of your inbox, but it doesn't get rid of it. It's not deleting it. I can still find it. So I can either search for it up here in the search box, or I can go to a filter or, a, I'm sorry, a label and find it there as well. I can do other things with filters, like say that any emails that are from app scripts notification at google.com, but also has the words autocrat, because that's a specific script, and was in two months of January 1st, 2013, um, and make it a much more specified search. And again, I can do other things. I can star it because I think that would be important. I can delete it. I can make sure it never gets sent to the spam folder, which is really helpful because sometimes your Gmail will send like evite invitations or emails from your network to the spam folder because it looks like spam. I could always forward it to somebody so I can automatically add a forwarding address to, some, uh, to another email address. So there's a lot of different things that I can do with these filters. Um, so it's really helpful to, to really get comfy with all of these different options. So those are the filters and labels, and hopefully that'll save you guys some time. Something else that's really helpful, um, moving beyond simply email, but looking at multiple accounts, is looking at multiple sign-on. So some of you probably have multiple Gmail accounts or multiple Google accounts. So perhaps you have one that is your district email, and you have another one that might be your uh, school um, your school email, and another one that's your personal email, and then you have a family email address. Um, with all of those different examples, uh, you're usually probably signing in and out of all of those different accounts by clicking up on this, your little icon, and clicking Add Account right here and signing into a different account. The problem is, is when you sign into different accounts, you'll have multiple tabs open in your Chrome browser, and it's really confusing to know which account which tab is signed into. So you might think that I'm in my demo account here and my personal account here, but if I open a third tab, which email address is that going to be signed into? Which, which, the more effective way to navigate between accounts is to use the Chrome, uh, Chrome user settings. So on the top right-hand corner here, you can see I have this friendly little dog, and if I click on that avatar, you'll see I have a drop-down with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different email addresses that I use. So I have um, a resident demo uh, email account, I have my personal uh, address, I have um, a Google Apps address, which is a practice domain, and I have all these different windows opening up. And the nice thing about all of these different things is that um, as I switch through them, everything in this window stays signed in to that same account. So all these tabs are all signed into this resident at auslchicago.org account. All of the tabs in this browser window are signed into this ausldemo at gmail.com account. They all uh, keep that same sign in, so I don't have to worry about crossing it over. The way that you set this up is by clicking on this uh, little menu settings uh, button right here, and you go to the settings of your Chrome browser, and you want to make sure you're going to your Chrome browser settings, not your Gmail settings. So again, in Gmail, if you click on this little cog or uh, wheel right here, this is your settings for your Gmail. This is where we did the accounts and the forwarding. But to get to the settings of your actual browser, you're clicking on the, these three lines that are on the browser window itself. So again, down here, this is the settings for the Gmail, and up here, this is the settings for your Chrome browser. So when I'm in the settings for my Chrome browser, the one, two, three, four, fifth option down is users. And under users, you can add a new user. And when you click add new user, 
it asks you to put in a name and pick an avatar. So I can pick like this little alien avatar and I can call it school email accounts. And then when I click create, it gives me a sign in page. And all I need to do is sign in to my school email accounts and put in my password. And once I click sign in, now this little, every time I click on this little um, alien avatar, it's always going to be signed into my school email account. If I want to delete that account, I can go back to my Chrome settings and click on it. And all I need to do is click delete and it's gone. So that's an easy way to add different users to your Chrome browser window. So it's easy to switch back and forth between users and not have to sign in and out of different accounts all the time. Uh, you can see here I have all of my different school accounts. I even have my husband's email account here um, so he can use my computer without signing in and out. Another awesome thing that you can do um, is something called incognito window. And what incognito window does is if you click on the settings and you go to new incognito window, you'll see that your avatar is this little spy guy on the top right hand corner. And for PC users, the spy guy is usually on the top left hand corner. And you'll see a, a dark blue um, header at the top or a uh, browser bar. And the reason uh, why incognito window is helpful is because A, it doesn't save any passwords. So if I go to gmail.com here and I log in, it will not save my email address or password. So if I'm using a public computer or signing in on a friend's computer, I don't have to worry about um, their browser accidentally saving my password. Secondly, when I sign out or I just close the browser, it automatically signs me out of all of those things. So I don't have to worry about my, leaving myself signed in. A third great thing is I don't have to sign out of my account. So if I'm sitting here using my email, da -da 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 -da, sending emails, doing cool things, and someone comes over and they say, hey, can I check my email on your computer? Normally, I'd have to sign out of this account so they can sign in. But with incognito window, I can just pop open an incognito window, go to Gmail, and they can go ahead and check their email right here while I'm still signed into my email address in this other window. I don't have to worry about signing out for them. Another great thing about incognito is it, window is it does not save any of your browser history. So if, I, so if I'm on Amazon.com and I'm searching for Christmas presents for my husband and I'm thinking about buying him, let's see, a Kindle Fire and I want him to have a Kindle Fire for Christmas and I'm looking at this and I know that my sneaky husband's going to come and check my browser history later, um, he won't see that I was looking at a Kindle Fire. Um, as a school use case, a lot of times teachers use uh, school computers to preview web quests for their students. So I might be searching for my students to look at the history of Illinois. So I could do history of Illinois, and I could be looking at um, this really cool uh, info please map here, and I want them to find this. But I don't want them to automatically see this map. I want them to search it, and I want them to use their um, search skills and internet digital literacy skills to find this page on them on their own. Now normally if I've been looking um, at this or doing this browser search on a regular browser window, it might autofill this this address when they t start typing Illinois. Um, and they'll say, oh well here's an obvious website I could go to. But with incognito window it won't save that search history so they won't be able to cheat and look at your browser history to find uh, the, the pages that you want them to go to. So that's also quite helpful, especially if they're taking an assessment. So uh, there we go. Um, another great thing to check out are Google Tasks. And Google Tasks are really helpful because it can allow you to archive messages in your inbox, um, but keep them uh, as references so that you're able to reference the email at a later time. So I'm going to go ahead and go to my own email, which might be a little bit dangerous to do on a live webinar, but I think it should be okay. Actually, you know what? We'll do it in this. We'll do it right here because this one's open. So we'll stay in this uh, AUSL demo email. And the first thing I need to do to use Google Tasks here is make sure that my shortcut settings or my keyboard settings are on. So I'm going to click on the widget from within Gmail to go to my Gmail settings. And then I am going to go about halfway down, and I'm going to make sure my keyboard shortcuts are on, and they are. So I can see that they're on. And I'm going to click Save at the bottom. Oops, 
let's move this out of the way. I'm going to make sure I click Save Changes, and I'm going to go back to my inbox. Now I'm going to go ahead and um, read an email. So let's see here. Um, I see this email from EduCreations, and it says that um, they see that we're using EduCreations and see if I have any questions, and maybe I want to follow up. I want to write back to Megan here and say, yes, I do have some questions, but I don't really have time to, uh, to respond to her right now. So all I need to do is push Shift and T. And when I push Shift and T, you can see it popped up a little task list on my lower uh, right-hand corner here, and it says Tasks. And it created a little uh, task right here that's the same uh, task name as the subject, oops, as the subject of that email. Now all I have to do is click on that uh, task and press Shift Enter. And I can set a due date for me to respond to Megan about that. So I'm going to set it for tomorrow. And if I click back to list, you can see now it has a due date. Now the really cool thing about that is when I go to my Google Calendar, you'll see I have a little red uh, task now right here on my calendar that says EduCreations Follow-Up. And not only do I have that task with a little checkbox that I can click to say that I'm finished with it, but it also has the related email, a link right here, so I can click on that and go right back to the email with Megan so that I can reference it for later. So I can archive this uh, email from Megan. I don't need it anymore in my inbox because I can easily find it from my task list. So let's do that again one more time. Uh, let's see here. Um, here is an email from um, my colleague Kara, and we have a leadership lunch coming up, and I need to remember to, to prepare for this. So instead of doing it right now or leaving it in my inbox to worry about later, I'm going to press Shift T, and it's going to send it to my task list. And I actually want to change what this says because it, it's too long, so I'm going to say prepare for leadership lunch. And now I'm going to press Shift Enter to set a due date. I'm going to set a due date to do this next Thursday after Christmas. And all I have to do now is go ahead and look at my Google Calendar. And when I check my Google Calendar for that day, you'll see right there I have that task on September 26 with a little checkbox ready for me to do. And here's the related email right here. I can just click that and get to the email. I don't have to worry about searching my inbox for it or worrying about where it went. I have a link to that, uh, that appropriate email right there from the task. So I can archive this knowing, I can go ahead and archive this email knowing that it'll be easy for me to find in the future. And so that's how I operate. I have my Google Calendar here with all of my different tasks um, on that day. And when I get my email in the morning of my agenda for the day, I can see what tasks I have to do, and I can move these tasks around. So if I say, you know what, I actually think that I'll have more time to do this on that Friday, I'll just move my task around, and it will remind me on that day. So I won't forget about it. I'll definitely follow up on it. I have it set to follow up on a specific day, and it's easy to find the email. And if I need to take any notes, I can leave it here. So I can say, reference, educreations, educreations app for this task. So Google Tasks, very helpful. But the nice thing about Google Tasks is there's also um, a lot of different ways that you can use it. So beyond clicking Shift-T from your Gmail email message, there's also an app for your Android phone. So if you go to G-Tasks, G-Tasks for your Android phone, um, then you can actually have a scrollable widget on your home screen for your phone, or, um, in, or you can actually just have an app that you can access all of these tasks and uh, check them off or access the email directly from your phone. So your tasks follow you wherever you are, and they become mobile as well, which is very, very helpful because sometimes it's hard to uh, slog through an inbox with 3,000 emails on the go. And now let's move on to calendar. So we've looked at different tasks that you could do. We've looked at different Gmail tricks to make your life a little bit easier. But something else that you could do is also manage your scheduling a little bit more efficiently as well. So with calendar sharing and appointments, uh, there's a couple of different ways to do this more efficiently. One way is by creating a public calendar. So what that is, is it's sharing your calendar with the world, but not what you're doing, but when you're busy. So, for example, 
on my calendar here, I don't necessarily want to show everyone in the world that, you know, I'm watching Game of Thrones this weekend or going to a holiday party on the 22nd or a bar crawl on the 28th. I don't want my students' parents to see that. I don't, I don't need um, everyone necessarily to see exactly what I'm doing at every minute of the day. But with that being said, I might want people to know when I'm busy. So I might want to say to a group of people, hey, let's schedule um, a meeting. And instead of me trying to sift through my calendar and find the times that I'm busy or not busy, I might instead want people just um, my busy, not busy times. And so do that is by going to your calendar. And I'm actually going to use my real calendar for this because it's a little bit more helpful. So you can see on my real calendar, it's quite packed. And you can see all of my little tasks on here. But when I click on my calendar and I click share this calendar, and I'll do that again a little bit more slowly with you in a moment, I have the option to make this calendar public. And I can click share only my free busy information, high details. So you're going to want to make sure that you click both of those options, uh, make this calendar public and share only my free busy information. Then you're going to want to click on calendar details. And you're going to want to look for your calendar address, which is down at the bottom. And you're going to want to click the HTML blue button, and you get this nice link right here. And so then, if I'm viewing my calendar as somebody else, I'm going to go to an incognito window, because then I can view it as how someone from the public would see my calendar, uh, not me, who signed into my own address. This is what the world sees when I share that link. So they don't see what I'm doing each day. All they see is when I'm busy. And you can see, um, you can see that I'm busy right now at 2.45 because I'm, I'm with all of you. So I'm busy here. Um, I'm going to be busy today at 5, et cetera. So um, I can share this calendar and let people know uh, when I'm busy, but not necessarily what it is that I'm doing. Um, and instead of sharing that re this really long URL with people, you can go to a great website called bit.ly bit.ly, like Charlie bit me, B-I-T-L-Y. Um, and what this does is it allows you to put a link in it and shorten it. And so it gives you a much shorter link, but if you join bit.ly, it actually lets you personalize that link. So because I'm logged into bit.ly over here on this uh, browser window, not my incognito window, when I click pa uh, paste a link here, if I click this little pencil, I can change this last part to say Megara or something else, so it's an easy to remember URL that I can share with people. So it's like a personalized vanity URL that you don't have to pay for, which is very, very helpful. What's also nice about that is once you've created the URL, you get to see the stats of how many people click on it. So this is the URL I've created for today's, um, for today's session or for today's presentation, and I can see how many people have clicked on it. And since we haven't shared it yet, it's only been clicked on two times. So that's a quick way to share uh, your calendar and manage some appointments. But there's also another way that you could do this if you don't want to share your entire calendar that way. And that's called appointment slots. Um, appointment slots, what that does is it allows you to create a block of time and create um, incremental slots for people to sign up with for, almost like uh, signing up for office hours uh, when you were in college with your professor. So I could say from 11.30 to 4.30, I'm free to meet with parents for parent-teacher conferences. And each conference is going to be 30 minutes each. And so it creates 30-minute increments and puts slot, 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 slot. And instead of saying test slot, it would probably say whatever you wanted to call this, so parent-teacher conference slot. And then you share the link with your parents. And they have to click that slot, and they put in their information. And it would make the slot taken, and then um, you'd know. And it would send a calendar invite to both of you, so you know that you're meeting at that time. Uh, it's really nice and easy to use. The con about using this are a couple. One, you must be in a Google Apps for Education or a Google Business uh, account to do this. So you couldn't be using a Gmail account to, to initiate this. Um, to start appointment slots, you'd have to be in like a district email or a school email or a business email. Um, the second is, is that to participate in it, the people would need to be using um, a Google account as well so that they could get the calendar invite. So they could be using a gmail.com account, but they would have to be signed into one of those Google Calendar accounts to be able to click the test slot and schedule an appointment in it so that they could see it in their Google Calendar. 
The third con to this is that they're fixed times. So if you set up 30-minute slots, all of the slots are going to be 30 minutes long. You can't have a 30-minute slot and then a 45-minute slot and then a 90-minute slot. They'd all need to be 30-minute slots. So if you're trying to meet with teachers during prep and lunch and after school, and those are all variable uh, durations, then uh, appointment slots might not work best for you. In the case of that, and you want to try and do uh, a very different type of appointments, um, and you want to be able to have um, people using different accounts, then I would suggest a website called doodle.com, D-O-O-D-L.com. And this actually does integrate with Google Calendar, so you can still use that. But even if you don't use Google Calendar, you can use Outlook or another calendaring, um, calendaring service, Doodle works. And the way it works is it creates a survey, and then you put in your name, and you check off the times that you're free, and then it easily tells you who has uh, which time slot was the most popular. So this is a great way to schedule with a bunch of people without sending emails back and forth saying, I'm not busy on Thursday, Tom's busy on Friday, I'm not busy on Friday. Judy's busy on Wednesday. Uh, it, it definitely uh, makes that a lot more efficient. So getting back to inbox zero, um, there's, you know, again, remembering that Corey had told us that using your inbox as a to-do list is allowing your schedule to be dictated by the tyranny of others. And just as a shout out, here's Corey um, in, in all of his happy self. And if you'd like to follow him on Twitter, he's at Pavisic, that's his last name. He's out of uh, the University of Boulder in Colorado, and he has lots of great tips that he shares on Twitter. So be sure to follow Corey and get lots of great ideas from him. But um, he showed me the four Ds to achieving Inbox Zero, and it was because of Corey that I first got to Inbox Zero. And the four Ds are defer it, archive it, which used to be delete it, but in Gmail terms we call it archive because there's no real reason to delete anything in Gmail. Delegate it or do it. So the first D, defer it. When you're checking your email in the morning or evening, if something's going to take you longer than about two minutes to do, it's not a quick response like, OK, gotcha, no problem, or here's the email address, or here's the phone number, then defer it. Write a quick email back to them and say, hey, thanks so much. Um, I'll get back to you on December 31st. And then click Shift T and send it to your task list, like I was showing you how to do, and set a little task for yourself to get back to it on December 31st. The next one is archive it. If it's you know just a quick you know heads up or a thank you email, you don't even need to reply it, uh, to it. Just hit E, archive it. You don't need it in your inbox anymore. The next thing is delegated. If someone's sending you an email that's not really your job to do and you're not the right person, then forward it. Say. Hey, hey, Judy, thanks so much for your email. Actually, the person who works on Wi-Fi at our school is Tom. So hey, Tom, can you see Judy's email below? She's looking at infrastructure questions. So click F to forward and delegate it. And all of these in bold are your hotkeys uh, that will allow you to uh, do all of these tasks without actually clicking. It'll just type F, and it will forward. And the last one is do it. So click R to reply and reply back to them and, and give them an answer. And that's, again, if it takes under two minutes. So if someone's saying, hey, can you send me Tom's email address, click reply and be like, hey, it's Tom at chicagopublic.org. Or, you know, what, what are you bringing on Friday for the cookie swap? And I'll say Oreos because I'm lazy. So it's a quick way to respond. Uh, type R, do it. But again, only if it takes a couple minutes. Because if it's, gonna, it's something that you're going to have to look up a bunch of data or do something that takes a long time or grade a bunch of papers, you're going to get sucked into that email vortex again. And, and you're not going to be very productive. So that's for on, upcoming emails and how to keep yourself from gaining more emails in your inbox. But um, in terms of thinking about future emails and emails that have come in the past, you might also want to think about using this Chrome extension. Boomerang for Gmail is free for the first 10 credits a month. You can use it 10 times a month for free. And what this allows you to do is two things, or actually a couple of things. One thing is scheduling emails to send later. So let's say you have uh, a, a, big, uh, a big publishing party with your class coming up right after break. And it's going to be on January 6th when everyone returns from break. And you want to remember to send an email to all the parents inviting them to this publishing party. And you're, you want to remember to do it. You remember right now. But if you send it now, they'll all forget over Christmas break. Um, so what you could do is type up the email right now. And then what Boomerang allows you to do is schedule the email to go out later. So I'll type up the whole email and then schedule it to go out on 
January 5th at 8 a.m. So it'll automatically send at that time. So uh, you can schedule it for a specific date and time or in a certain number of days or a certain number of hours and then Boomerang will automatically send it for you. Another thing that it does and the reason it's called Boomerang is because it'll send an email back to your inbox if it hasn't been responded to in a, in a set amount of time. So if I send an email to my colleague saying, hey, uh, did you get a, a parent chaperone for Friday's field trip? And, and normally I'd send it and think, okay, it's done, and they never respond, and I forget about it, and Friday rolls around, and we have no parent volunteer. Instead, what I could do is send the email and then set it to boomerang back to my inbox if that teacher hasn't responded by Wednesday, let's say. And so they haven't responded by Wednesday, and then I see my own email back in my inbox reminding me that they haven't responded and reminding me that it needs to be followed up on. So that's that's really helpful thing to do too. And again, this is free for using up to 10 times a month, and otherwise you can buy credits to use it uh, more extensively. So uh, at this point, normally I would ask you to start cleaning out your inbox, and we'd be doing it together, but we're running a little bit short on time. So I'll let you do that on your own, and I'm going to share with you a couple more tricks to achieve your own inbox zero. So remember, you're going to want to First, uh, archive all items older than three months. If something's been sitting in your email for more than three months, you're probably not going to look in that inbox anyway. So go ahead and archive it. You'll still be able to find it. It's not going to delete it. You'll be able to access it later, but it won't be clogging up that inbox. So go ahead and do a search or a filter um, like we saw at the beginning of this webinar, and then just archive all emails uh, older than three months. Then use filters to tag and organize all your items, and then archive them. So, you know, tag all the emails from your boss, tag all the emails that are from your students, um, so that you'll be able to find them later, and then archive them so that you'll be able to clean out that inbox. And then what to do with what's left, the four Ds. Defer it, send them to the, the to-dos to your task list, delegate it, forward emails to others, uh, archive it, don't delete it, um, that should say archive it, so that you don't need to worry about them. Um, and a, a quick way to do this without and make kind of gamifying it, making it fun, is using this Chrome extension called the Email Game Button for Gmail. And what it does is it puts a timer on the top of your uh, email or your Gmail inbox, and it, it times you on how quickly you can get through your emails, and it, it prompts you and gives you suggestions with what to do for each uh, each email. And it's a quick way to clean out your inbox in a in a fun way, but also making you a little bit more productive. So that's a Chrome extension called the Email Game Button for Gmail. There's also email ga.me, like email game with a little dot or a period between ga and me, the email game. And it's very similar to that Chrome extension, uh, but it's a website. And uh, if you don't use Google Chrome or you don't like installing extensions, this is another great way to clean out your inbox in a fun and quick way. So uh, it's cleaning time. Hopefully this webinar has given you a chance to get some ideas on how to clean out that inbox, become a little bit more efficient. Here are some links for how to access your task list um, without going through your Gmail inbox. If you just want to see a list of your tasks that you create, you can go to that link. And uh, if you want to activate that Google Activity Report that I was talking to you about at the beginning and see how many emails you send every month, how many emails you receive, who you email the most, who emails you the most, that's the link for this. And um, these links will be um, in this PowerPoint that we're sharing um, at the end of this webinar. So hopefully you can change that number in your inbox and get down to inbox zero. Um, for more uh, information, and if you have any questions, please follow me on Twitter. That's my, email, uh, that's my Twitter handle, and I'll be sure to respond and share ideas. But we have a few minutes left, so I'm going to take the last couple minutes to sort through the questions here that you've been asking during the webinar and see uh, if I can answer any of them. So I'm just going to quickly go through them. So yes, this will be available. The PowerPoint will be available, and uh, they'll be sharing that, I think, on the McGraw-Hill website if not tweeting it, and I think Doug could talk about that more at the end. Yeah, um, Jane, um, we're going to be sending a follow-up email to everyone um, uh, with a link to the recording and then uh, some other links that you presented and some other uh, uh, content that was in the presentation so it's easily accessible for everybody. So um, I, I was monitoring questions, and we actually have a couple here uh, that were um, uh, needed to address. We've got one from Paula, um, and back when you were talking about tasks, Jenny, she was asking, 
as far as tasks go, what happens if uh, you don't do it by the due date that you, you put in for the task? Great question. If you don't do the due date by the time that the task is due, nothing happens. It doesn't punish you, um, but it stays on your calendar, so it doesn't disappear. So you can see on your calendar that you missed a task, and you can always drag it and move it to a, a future date. So it doesn't disappear. It'll stay there, and it will stay there forever until you do something with it, either check it off or delete it. Um, but it doesn't, uh, it also doesn't penalize you or message you. Awesome, awesome. Uh, then Kathy also, she asked a kind of a follow-up question when you were talking about sharing calendars. She asked, can you share more than one calendar? So I guess you have multiple accounts. Yep, so if you have different calendars, all you need to do is go to that settings for the calendar and you can create different URLs for each calendar and make each one public. Um, and then we've got a couple coming in here. Derek is asking, what is the best way to share a calendar to allow multiple users to schedule items? And he gave conference room, meeting, et cetera, as examples. Can you ask that question again? Sorry. Oh, he was asking, what is the best way to share a calendar to allow multiple users to schedule items, like uh, for offices, maybe for conference rooms or and meetings at schools, things like that? So on Google Calendars, the fabulous thing is it's collaborative. So you can make as many people editors of that calendar as you wish. So you can either make them viewers so they can just see it, or you can make them editors where they can actually add events or modify events on there. And what I'd suggest for that is creating a Google group. Um, that's groups.google.com and adding your organization members to that group and then sharing the calendar with that, with that group email address so they can all access the calendar rather than adding them one at a time. The nice thing about that is if somebody joins or leaves your organization, all you have to do is remove them from the Google group and then, then they get, either gain or lose access to all the different assets you've shared with them. Thank you. Um, I've had a few people ask this question. Um, can you create recurring tasks in Google Tasks? Ooh, that's a great question. I actually have never seen this happen before, and I don't think you can. Um, if anyone who's listening to the webinar um, knows that you can, please tweet me, but I have never been able to, nor have I ever seen that option. Gotcha. And then I've got one here uh, from Colleen. If you forward multiple emails to the Gmail, are the emails still going into the other email accounts? Yes. So you can, um, when you forward it, you can give the option to um, skip, the, skip the other email address altogether and delete it from that inbox, uh, archive it in that inbox, or keep it as unread or mark it as read. Um, so even though the emails are forwarding to the new account, it's like they're stopping off at your original account first, and then you get to decide what happens when they sit there and then moving on, almost like making a copy of it and sending it on to the other email address. Great. Um, Sherry uh, sent a question in. She's got like a, a troubleshooting question, so maybe you can help. Uh, she's asking, why do I get an invite when another user adds an event to our shared calendar? So I don't know if you can help with that one at all. So if someone else is adding something to the shared calendar, they might be putting your email address on it too, in which case they're inviting you. Um, so you will get that notification. Gotcha. Um, David just asked, can the Google Calendar import uh, Microsoft Outlook Calendar events? Yes. Yeah, so if you um, go to your settings in the Google Calendar, you have the option to import or export as an Outlook, um, as an Outlook Calendar. So that was in the settings. So if I go to my calendar and I, let's hit OK. Um, you can see here that I have XML, iCal, all of that right here. Um, and so I can go ahead and um, embed or upload new calendar events or export old calendar events um, through, through those different links. Great, thank you. Um, that seems to be most of the questions I'm seeing. If anybody else any, has any questions, feel free to enter them in now. We'll wait just a couple more minutes here. Uh, while we're waiting for more questions, a few of you have been asking um, if you can get a copy of the PowerPoint and uh, if you get follow-up. Uh, yes, we are going to be sending um, a follow-up email from the uh, from this webinar with the recording and a few of the um, uh, links and other resources. And uh, and it will also be uh, this will be archived on our YouTube channel, um, so you'll get a link to that as well in, in the follow-up. Um, so I'm not seeing any other questions yet. Um, 
if anybody else has. Cindy just asked, uh, much of what you are doing seems to need the use of Chrome as a browser. Is that true? Or can yes. you do some of this through other browsers? So the, um, any, the, all the extensions and the switching back and forth between users, those are all Chrome-based. However, the tasks, Google Calendar, all the Gmail shortcuts, all of that you can do in any browser. Great. That's, that's perfect. That, that, uh, that's a good question. Well, it seems like that um, is the end of all our questions. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, Jenny, uh, it was a pleasure to have you on the webinar again. Uh, as usual, thank you so much for your time. Uh, and we look forward to, to working with you again soon. Um, and uh, thank you, everybody, for spending time with us here so close to the holidays. Um, we really appreciate it. There's going to be a survey that opens as you exit the webinar. We would really appreciate your feedback there few questions on uh, some ideas and some needs that you guys might have for future technology webinars from McGraw-Hill Education. So we'd really appreciate your ideas and your feedback so we can uh, do some more of these in the future. Um, thanks again. Thank you, Jenny. And happy holidays, everybody. Thank you.